All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining the special Sabre Joint Chapters meeting, the Dusty Baker Sacramento uh, Sabre Chapter and Lefty O'Doul Bay Area Chapter uh, with the Pacific Coast League Historical Society. Um, Pacific Coast League is something very near and dear to my heart as my great uncle used to be a uh, player in the league in the 30s and 40s. Um, based on the teams he played for though uh, I amongst the uh, the league teams I'm actually least familiar with the star so I'm looking forward to uh, tackling a little bit more of this great book from Dan and also hearing more from him tonight so I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Arlene she's going to do a few safer announcements and then she'll take it over to uh, Mark McCray the director of the Pacific Coast League Historical Society before we uh um, get the great presentation from Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Zach, and welcome, everybody. Um, our co the Lefty O'Doul co-chair, Steve Treder, Treder, is here, too. Steve, you want to say anything? I just want to say hello. Welcome to everybody. And I, I'm sure, like you, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dan. I was a big fan of Dan's earlier book about the, uh, about the Genovese family and scouting, and Dan was a big uh, yeah. source of of uh, help to me in researching my book on Horace Stoneham. So it's great to actually put a face with a name and, the, and a voice <laughs> on the phone. So, oh, Dan, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. And I, again, want to welcome um, the Pacific Coast League Historical Society. Um, I've spent many marvelous hours at the reunions with you and um, I'm really glad that you're here with us tonight. Uh, some very quick Sabre and other uh, announcements. You Sabre members would, should have received uh, an email this week that the Sabre elections are open. So please take a moment to vote. There's a link in that email. Mark Armour is running again for president, Todd Leibowitz for secretary. And then there's three candidates for director, Tara Krieger, Alex Marks and Tyrone Brooks. So please be sure to cast your vote. Um, you've also seen, uh, in Sabre, recent Sabre emails, uh, information about the current uh, spring member discount, the opening of baseball, baseball better together. Um, this uh, is a membership recruitment drive that offers a 21% discount for any new membership, whether it's student, regular, or uh, my favorite senior, senior uh, memberships uh, through the end of April. So it's a great time to give a gift if you wanna give someone the gift of, of Saber um, or the PCL. Historical Society folks, if you want to join us too, we'd love to have you. Um, you'll also be seeing information about the Sabre 50 fundraising campaign coming out soon. Please take a look at that. And I will remind you um, in emails. Got a couple of books I wanted to just mention briefly. We got an email from our member, Larry Baldessaro, who has a new book on Tony Lazeri out. And I believe that is at Nebraska Press. And um, the new Saber book on Jackie Robinson dropped uh, last week on Jackie's birthday. So that is, it, that is available as an ebook for members. So please take a look and download it and enjoy it. Um, I also want to remind you upcoming dates for uh, our joint member meetings. On May 18th, Scott Bush, the Saber CEO, will join us and Talk about the changes in minor league baseball. It's a really fascinating presentation on how the uh, minor leagues have been restructured. And maybe he'll talk about some of the, the rule changes that they're looking at uh, in the minor leagues. On June 1st, Steve Treder, our own Steve Treder, will be talking about his new book on Horace Stoneham, 40 Years a Giant. And that's a Tuesday. That same week on Saturday morning, Lincoln Mitchell at, at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Lincoln Mitchell will be talking about his book on the Giants. Um, I think it's called The Team by the Bay. I'm sorry, I don't have the title with me, but so Tuesdays, Tuesdays, except for a Saturday coming up. Uh, really happy to have some, some things scheduled down the line and we look forward to you joining us. Um, so Mark, it's all yours. Thanks, Marlene. Well, welcome everybody tonight. Uh, and this is clearly uh, uh, a repeat of uh, similar 
uh, joint meetings that we've had in the past. Uh, both chapters of SABRE here in Northern California, the Sacramento and San Francisco Bay Area chapters have worked together uh, very well uh, for a number of years, putting together a lot of uh, joint promotions. Uh, this one uh, uh, is actually nicer because it's uh, the three of us, the PCL Historical Society, which is essentially a spinoff of SABRE, and we've all worked together on different uh, promotions in the past and projects in the past. Uh, tonight is going to be a little different. Uh, the topic will be on the Hollywood Stars and the Pacific Coast League. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, author uh, Dan Taylor, who's uh, uh, researched and put out uh, a wonderful book on uh, one of the, the most colorful uh, franchises in the Pacific Coast League's history. Uh, you'll find um, the link between three cities, uh, San Francisco, Hollywood, and Salt Lake. And it's like a, a merry-go-round between those three cities with uh, the Hollywood Club, the Mission Club, uh, and it, it's just a, a, an interesting uh, a chapter. What most people agree, even though the earlier Hollywood chics had some excitement to them, uh, the golden age was when the missions moved back down to uh, Southern California and the Hollywood stars at 20 year time frame from uh, 1938 to uh, 1957. That was uh, the most colorful um, Many of you have been fortunate to attend some of the Pacific Coast League reunions in the past where we've had members talk about the fun that they had uh, down at Gilmore Field uh, and, and Hollywood uh, as well, uh, just some of the great player stories. But uh, Dan's got a lot to share and I, I know Zach already gave it a plug. I'm gonna give it another plug. It's a great book, um, pick it up. It's good for Christmas, Father's Day, uh, bar mitzvahs, whatever, but uh, definitely get a copy of it for yourself. Dan, the floor is yours, sir. Oh, Mark, thanks for the kind introduction. And, and Mark and Zach and Marlene, thanks for this great invitation. And thanks to all of you for joining. It's really great to be part of uh, this joint meeting. And uh, Marlene, I guess this is how you get me to the Lefty O'Doul uh, meetings. Being a member <laughs> seems like when I come, it's when I'm speaking. I've got, I want to get more involved. So thanks very much. You know, for me, this was such a treat and, and such a rewarding experience uh, to become involved in researching and writing this book. There were mornings I would wake up and I'd be eating breakfast while going through uh, digitized editions of newspaper articles about the Hollywood Stars games from 1940 and 41. And I think that's the closest that, that we're going to feel to time travel, you know, sitting down eating breakfast, reading about the game from the night before. And it was such, a, such great fun to be planted and immersed in this research in, like Mark said, the golden era of really one of the great leagues in baseball history, the Pacific Coast League. Uh, the Hollywood Stars, there were so many uh, interesting teams in that league. You had, obviously, the LA Angels at that time were an incubator for the, the Chicago Cubs. Uh, William Wrigley, P.K. Wrigley, really experimented with a lot of things down in Los Angeles that they wanted to implement in Chicago. Uh, you had the Seals during the Paul Fagan ownership era that were, were very innovative. Paul Fagan, of course, really was the first to bring a, a retail store, uh, a team retail store, which is so widely employed now. So uh, I think, of course, Paul Fagan, probably uh, one of his uh, not so bright moments was banning the sale of peanuts one season at the uh, Seal Stadium, but uh, he was a very innovative guy. And then, of course, you had the Hollywood stars who really, they were a phenomenon. They were the glamour team of all of baseball. And, and, and that certainly was because of the involvement of all the movie stars. Uh, they were involved in, in the ownership group. They were season ticket holders, uh, box seat owners. And, and on any given night going out there, you had, you know, Bing Crosby, you had Harpo and Groucho Marx, uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart. You know, they were there every single night uh, when you talk to players. And, and, and the players would, would tell you that, that what amazed them was on joining the Hollywood stars, finding out that, that these big movie stars were as big a fans of them as they were the movie stars. And they were very involved. Uh, uh, Chuck Stevens uh, spoke of uh, Jimmy Stewart and his wife, inviting he and his wife to their home on many occasions for dinner. Uh, Bing Crosby, there were players that talked of Bing Crosby, taking them out golfing. Uh, Gail Patrick, who was the, the first wife of the principal owner, Bob Cobb. Uh, Gail Patrick, uh, later after divorcing Cobb, she and her third husband, uh, they had a, lived in a big estate and they would invite the players and their families over on the Monday off days for barbecues and, and pool parties. 
So it was a very unique environment. And uh, they were the, the celebrities were so involved. Uh, if you were to go to Gilmore Field on Bat Day, for instance, uh, there's a good chance that uh, Barbara Stanwyck or Gary Cooper would be handing you your, your souvenir bat as you press through the turnstiles. Uh, guys like uh, Bill Frawley, who we know as Fred Mertz from I Love Lucy. Uh, Bill Frawley constructed in the ballpark a big, uh, uh, you know, a hall, of, hall of Honor. He did one for the Hollywood players that were away during the war years that another that showcased the, uh, the the player of the year each year. Uh, of course, he caused a little bit of problems. Uh, Bill Frawley was a guy who uh, could empty a bottle uh, as well as the best of them. And there were times when he got out ahead of himself. Uh, one season, he offered the, the managing and the business manager job to Mickey Cochran, the great catcher. Uh, the trouble was when the when word got in the sporting news and other publications that Cochran is going to be the manager, why it caught everybody with the Hollywood stars completely off guard until they found that the offer was made at a banquet that Frawley was at where Frawley had had a little too much to drink and uh, Bill had to be reined back in a little bit. But uh, it was an amazing time and, a, and an amazing environment. But really what that environment I think has done is it's overshadowed the, the true legacy of the Hollywood stars. And, and that's as the most, I think, innovative team in baseball history. Uh, we touched on, on Paul Fagan and his in innovations with the Seals at, at Seal Stadium. But when you look at the Hollywood stars, there's so much they brought to baseball that really, for the most part, they've never received credit for. They were the very first minor league team on March 30th, 1940, to do a game on television. Uh, there were only 300 sets in Los Angeles at that time. And uh, in Long Beach, 20 miles to the south, uh, shop owner put a television set in his store window. So many people gathered to watch the Stars opening day game, 1940 op season opener, that it spilled out into the street. And the police had to come and break it up because it was blocking traffic. And uh, they were the, the third team in all of baseball to put a game on television. The Dodgers and the New York Giants had televised a game in August of 39. Hollywood later became uh, very immersed in television, and it was, a, it was a controversy up and down the Coast League because Hollywood got to televising every single home game. Uh, there were a few years where the Angels did as well, and that meant that uh, on any given night during the course of the season, because the two, one of the two teams was always at home in Southern California, now you could flip on your television set and, and watch live baseball. But uh, the other Coast League teams didn't like it because they were getting a share of the gate. They felt that television kept the crowds down. Well, uh, the Hollywood people argued just the opposite. They argued that uh, with so many people moving to Los Angeles and the community growing at such a rapid rate after the war, that this was advertising. They were exposing the product to people in Southern California and that it was ultimately going to do nothing but help attendance. The Stars were the first team to fly. Uh, baseball really frowned on, on putting its teams on airplanes, and there were some players that didn't like the idea of flying either, but the American League and National League presidents had told their clubs that they were very worried that flying, if you had an accident, you could lose an entire ball club. That didn't phase the Hollywood people. Uh, they, uh, coming out of the war, uh, they not only sent their teams by air up to San Francisco and Oakland and to Seattle and to Portland, but they did it by charter. Uh, they struck a deal with Western Airlines. There was advertising signs on the fence and in the program. And uh, they struck a deal to use Western Airlines planes and they chartered the team up to the north. So it was very unique that way. And of course, all of you that know about the Hollywood stars know that on April 1st, 1950, uh, the Hollywood stars debuted a very unique new uniform, short pants and a t-shirt for the top. It was really the brainchild of the manager, Fred Haney. And I think he'd been prodded to it. A columnist in the Times uh, late in the 1949 season had suggested that Hollywood should try to come up with some unique new uniform idea, something that hadn't been tried in baseball. Now, he didn't mention shorts specifically, but Fred Haney seized on that. And Haney said, well, this working in soccer, they play in shorts in soccer. What's wrong with giving it a try in baseball? And Haney sold it to his players. His players were really unhappy. I mean, some of the guys that were on that club told me that, that there was a lot of anger in that clubhouse when they broke open the boxes and revealed the shorts. Uh, the bat boy, Sandy Oster, told I asked him who the, the most uh, demonstrative were of the angry players. And he laughed and said, it was the guys with the ugliest legs. But uh, Haney sold it to his players on the lighter uniform would make them faster. And uh, Haney coached first base, and in the very first game they used them, uh, I believe it was against Seattle that afternoon, I, uh, 
Chuck Stevens was the leadoff hitter and he beat out an infield hit on the first at bat of the game. And when the umpire cried safe at first base, Fred Haney turned to the stands, threw up his arms and said, see, I told you they work. But a lot of the players is Haney, Haney employed a running type of game. He liked to steal. He liked to hit and run. He liked to squeeze. And the players, you know, they got upset because the sliding was chewing up their legs. Carlos Bernier was the most vocal about it. And ultimately, after two and a half seasons, uh, Haney shelved the idea. But they were a real favorite up and down the Coast League. In Seattle, uh, on the first uh, road trip that season, uh, the team took the field in their long pants. And the fans were, were upset. And, and they really went into a tizzy over it. And Haney explained after the game that, you know, it was a weather call, that if it was cold, they were not going to wear them. Uh, there was a night in Oakland, uh, of course, the ballpark in Emeryville, not far off the water. And uh, there was a night where they took the field in their shorts and their T-shirt tops. And, and after the first inning, the players came back in and said, we can't do this. Uh, the wind's coming off the bay. It's cold. And uh, Haney let them go back in and, and change back into their long pants and, and uh, their flannel tops. And the fans were pelting them and booing. And a number of fans just got up and left uh, because they, they had come to see the stars in shorts. So they were a unique team also in, in food items. Uh, one of the things that we see now at ballparks is every season a team will introduce some new gourmet food item. Well, on a much lesser scale, Hollywood was doing that. Uh, they started off with uh, something real simple, like your basic ballpark peanuts, but they served them uh, hot, fresh roasted, and uh, they put a prize in every single bag. The next year, they decided they were going to sell uh, fresh made donuts, made to order donuts. Uh, and then the following season, one of the things they tried was the electrocuted Frankfurter. So where did all this come from? Well, it came from the top. And the guy is someone who may have touched many of you, and you didn't even realize it. But uh, the guy at the top's name was Bob Cobb. And Bob Cobb was the owner of the most famous restaurant in the world at that time, the, the Brown Derby at Hollywood and Vine. He ultimately had four of them, but uh, his base of operation where his office was, was the, the, uh, the, the Hollywood and Vine one that was up uh, the street from where the studios were. And it was a Mecca uh, for the radio stars and the movie stars for lunch and dinner. And uh, how has Bob Cobb touched all of you? Well, many of you, I should say, well, Bob Cobb, there you go, Sandy, you got it. Bob Cobb brought to us the Cobb salad. And we've got that story in the book and I've gotten to know Bob's grandson really well. And he's promised me that when all this lifts, uh, he wants me down to his home for an authentic Cobb salad dinner. I think that's a great re reward for all this. I'm looking forward to it. But uh, Bob Cobb was an interesting guy. He was a sportsman. He grew up in Montana, loved baseball, but also hunting and fishing. Uh, he was an avid trap and skeet shooter. He competed in the national championships. He loved to get together with Clark Gable and uh, Harpo Marx, and they would go to a ranch and they would uh, steer rope. Uh, he was a baseball fan. He would go to Angels games and was appalled at, at the quality of the food that was served there. Uh, so in November of 1938, uh, when uh, Herbert Fleischhocker, who was the owner of the uh, previous missions, Mission Bells, Mission Red, San Francisco missions that had moved to Southern California and become the Hollywood stars for the 38th season, uh, Fleischhocker had gone broke. He'd lost some major lawsuits and had to liquidate. Uh, Bob Cobb's attorney secured an exclusive negotiating window, and uh, Cobb jumped at the opportunity to buy the ball club. He got on the phone and in a day and a half, he had rounded up 20 investors and they raised $200,000. The first call he made was to Cecil B. DeMille, the legendary director. And then he just went down his list. Bing Crosby, Barbara Stanwyck and her husband, Robert Taylor, on and on. And Gene Autry was one. And they had a, a huge gathering of celebrities that uh, helped them pull together $200,000. 40,000 bought the ball club and it was a terrible ball club. Uh, so bad economically that the, in the 38 season, they had had to forfeit one game when their equipment trunks didn't get loaded on the train. And when they got to the destination and didn't have it, they had to forfeit the first game of, of a road trip. So the Pacific Coast League fined them for it. And uh, the team couldn't pay the fine. They had to sell the contract of a player to raise the money in order to, to pay the fine. Uh, but that all changed when Bob Cobb put his investment group together and they bought the ball club. So uh, they raised $200,000, 40,000 bought the club. It was a distress sale. 50,000 was set aside to buy ball players, And then 100,000 went 
to pay half the cost of building Gilmore Field. They partnered with an oil man and, and land developer, Earl Gilmore. He also put up 100,000. He provided the land, a 20 year lease and supervised the construction. And they built this 10,000 seat ballpark. Cobb brought the philosophies he used at the Brown Derby to Gilmore Field and his operation of the Hollywood Stars. He always believed that uh, uh, celebrities wouldn't complain about where uh, uh, problems that they had. Uh, they simply wouldn't come back. And so when Gilmore Field was built, and it was at 3rd and Beverly, which is where the CBS complex is located now, uh, next door to the farmer's market, which the Gilmore family still owns and operates. Uh, when it was built, he put a, a VIP lounge in for the celebrities. They had an orchestra playing. They had uh, an open bar and a buffet meal before games. Uh, the type of boxes he put in, which we have pictures of in the book, they were patterned after both Hollywood Bowl and the Hollywood Park racetrack, where they had backing and a side and a little bit of privacy to them. They were much different than what you saw at ballparks. Uh, he was all about cleanliness. He had a crew uh, circulating the ballpark inside and out, picking up cigarette butts and wrappers. And I've often wondered because Walt Disney was an original box seat owner. And you see that same philosophy at the Disney parks. And I've all often wondered if that's where Walt Disney got that idea from was uh, his times at Gilmore Field. As I mentioned, Bob Cobb was a stickler about food quality. He hated ballpark food. Uh, he had derogatory names for the peanuts, the, the type of hot dog buns that they served. And, and so when he took over the ball club, he clashed with his food service director, a guy named Danny Goodman, who later had the same job uh, with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, Goodman was all about buy cheap, sell high, and Cobb wouldn't have it. Cobb wanted uh, real milk buns, for example. He was a stickler about the fat content in the ice cream, and he clashed with his wife about it. Uh, he wanted a high fat content in the ice cream, and, and he wanted meatless uh, hot dogs, meatless franks. He, he was just a, a huge stickler for the quality of the food. And, and many of the, the amenities of the ballpark, I mean, he, he outfitted the ladies' rooms, uh, like the ladies' rooms in the theaters that had uh, uh, spare makeup and sewing kits and attendants, uh, things that you just didn't see at ballparks at that time. There are some innovations that Cobb brought to the game that, that we do see now. And I should check, I should uh, bounce back that another thing that was, I think, kind of unique that Cobb did in uh, two particular areas, when I mentioned that they had 50,000 set aside to improve the club and buy ball players, the first two players he bought were bought with a purpose. Uh, the first, his manager had already left for the winter meetings before the sale went through. They were able to get a hold of the manager who was told he had no money to spend at the winter meetings. And when he arrived, he heard from Cobb that he had now bought the ball club and he had 50,000 to spend. So the first guy he went out and bought was Bill Sissel. Uh, Bill Sissel, the second baseman, they got him from the New York Giants, but Sissel had been an all-star, excuse me, previously uh, with the White Sox. And he became very popular. In fact, during the 39 season, uh, he got fined by uh, the president of the, of the Pacific Coast League. And it so incensed some of the movie stars, uh, Gary Cooper was one, Barbara Stanwyck, George Raft, that uh, they chipped in and paid Sissel's fine. Uh, but Sissel was their first buy, and then Babe Herman was the second buy. And these were huge because Cobb, he understood the Paramount Studios concept of star power. His first wife had been a part of it. She was a very popular actress in the 30s. And so Cobb understood it. And so by buying Sissel, and, and particularly Herman, who was from the area, uh, was a legend in the area, and was extremely popular in Southern California, he brought in star power. Buying them brought instant credibility to that ball club that had been so bad in 38, and it was box office. Herman was very, very popular, um, and Herman played with them up through the 1944 season, had a couple of huge seasons uh, at, at the plate for the Hollywood Stars. Uh, so Cobb was always thinking of, of these, these types of ideas and operating in a very different fashion. He also employed as his business manager a guy named Oscar Reichow. And Reichow had previously run the LA Angels until a falling out and Cobb snapped him up to be the business manager. And he was the business manager for a good 10 seasons with the club. And he was a very innovative guy. He was the, he, as, a, as a sports writer in Chicago, he was the guy that identified, recruited and championed Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis to be the commissioner of baseball. 
uh, he he was very uh, instrumental in in uh, the creation with Cobb of the California League. The, that minor league was a was a Hollywood star's idea. They wanted it to be a minor league just for the six California-based Pacific Coast League teams. It was started in '41. Uh, actually, this week is their 80th anniversary of the league's first week of operation. Um, and then World War II sent it on a hiatus with a lack of players. And then after World War II, the major league clubs saw the benefits of, of developing talent in California. And with their offers, they aced out the Pacific Coast League clubs. But you still see, I think now it's uh, low A West, but all these years, 79 years, the California League has been a lasting legacy of the innovativeness of the Hollywood stars. Some of the things that we see in baseball today, uh, that middle of the fifth inning groundskeeper coming out and, and grooming the infield, grounds crew grooming the infield. Well, that came from the Hollywood stars. They had uh, pitcher Jack Salveson in 1950, and, and Jack was at the end of his career, and he was a guy who worked very, very fast. He wanted to keep hitters off balance. But it also meant games were 20, 30, maybe even longer, uh, shorter than any other game that Hollywood would play because Salveson worked so quick. So they were trying to, to figure out uh, the best way to combat that because their revenues were down on the nights that Salveson pitched. And, and Cobb raised the idea of trying to create a 10 minute intermission. And the idea of what they could do to force this intermission was to bring out the grounds crew. They pitched it to the coast league, the coast league turned them down. They then went to uh, the, the uh, head of minor league baseball and he turned them down. They took it to the baseball rules committee and they received permission to experiment the last half of the 1950 season. So by 1951, everybody in baseball was doing it and they have been doing it ever since. The other, one of the other things that, that came from the Hollywood stars that we see now on a regular basis is Dodger Stadium. In uh, 1952, Cobb felt strongly that he had to build a new ballpark. Coming out of World War II in 1946, the Pacific Coast League made a concerted effort to try and gain major league status. Paul Fagan, the uh, SEALs owner, was one of the major uh, guys to push that. Uh, Pants Rowland, who was the president of the Coast League at that time, uh, really championed it hard. And the league, over several successive seasons, uh, made a very strong push to try and gain major league status and to become the third major league. Each time they did, they were shot down. When Ford Frick became the commissioner, he took a different tack than Happy Chandler had, had done prior. Ford Frick developed criteria for gaining major league status. The Pacific Coast League met many of, of those, but the one area that they fell short was the quality of their ballparks. The Angels Park, Wrigley Field in Los Angeles, that met major league standards. Steel Stadium was pretty close, uh, but they were landlocked and that was gonna give them some trouble. But the rest of the parks in the league, not a chance. Now, Cobb put together an initial plan to increase the seating of Gilmore Field from 10 to 20,000, but Earl Gilmore shot it down. He just, he couldn't see getting his money back if he was to spend on expanding the ballpark. So Cobb had been invited up to the police academy up in the hills north of downtown LA. And the police chief wanted his advice on putting in a kitchen and developing a banqueting program. Cobb got walking around the area and was immediately struck that he had, he had found the perfect place for a ballpark. He brought Bill Schroeder, uh, the longtime baseball, the longtime sports historian in Southern California. Uh, he brought Bill Schroeder with him a day or two later, and they surveyed the area, and Schroeder agreed that it was the perfect place for a ballpark. Cobb then engaged uh, an architect from Pasadena, Styles O. Clements, and together they designed what they called a super modern ballpark. This park had two restaurants, cocktail lounge, childcare, escalators from the parking lot up to the box offices and the turnstiles, and what Cobb called cabanas, which was not done in baseball at that time, but it's now done everywhere in arenas and stadiums. We know them as luxury suites, skyboxes, uh, whatever term you want to use. Uh, it was an amazing concept, and they went to the city, and the city was lukewarm. Uh, they didn't really believe that the Coast League had the, a legitimate chance at gaining Major League status. They felt their best bet was to bring in an existing club and that perhaps they could just use Wrigley Field or maybe the Coliseum. So uh, Cobb didn't get a lot of uh, help from the city. He 
went and spoke to the county supervisors and, and one of the supervisors was very eager to, to work with Cobb, but he wanted him to, to build in a different area and Cobb wasn't keen to do that. He felt that the best place was Chavez Ravine. Well, when the Philadelphia A's were sold and ultimately moved to Kansas City, that was a huge turning point uh, for Los Angeles in their effort to bring in a major league ball club. There were a number of businessmen who told the press that they were going to buy the A's and bring them to Los Angeles. But uh, when all was said and done, Del Webb, the uh, owner of the Yankees, let the hierarchy in Los Angeles know that the men that had come back had no plan for a ballpark and never revealed their financing. So the mayor of LA immediately, the, the, the press excoriated him and, and, and he had a press conference to try and, and calm this problem down. And, and he announced that he had a plan. He had a plan to build a ballpark that would bring a big league club to Los Angeles. And he held up a drawing and it was a drawing of, of Cobb. It was Cobb's drawing. He had basically taken Cobb's plan. Uh, so Cobb knew that he was a beaten man. He knew that the city wasn't going to support, and he pleaded repeatedly for the city to support the Pacific Coast League, and the city just uh, had no confidence in it. In 1957, when Walter O'Malley came out and, and made his fact-finding tour of Los Angeles, uh, he had told the city leaders that he wouldn't meet with any of them until he first met with Bob Cobb. So not long after uh, Mr. O'Malley's arrival in Los Angeles, he met with Cobb in the uh, uh, in his suite at this old Stadler Hilton Hotel, and Cobb brought all the papers. He brought the blueprints. He brought the drawings. He brought the maps of the area, showing that one day three freeways would serve as Chavez Ravine. And Cobb uh, uh, O'Malley was sold. Uh, he came out of that meeting, and he he announced that he had learned more from Cobb than he had from any city leaders uh, in the years that he had been thinking about Los Angeles, and uh, and he was locked into Chavez Ravine as the the site for his ballpark. And that dismayed some with the city. There were some that wanted him to uh, wanted to divert him into Wrigley Field, and and uh, O'Malley wouldn't go for that. There were others who felt that uh, the Coliseum was a good long-term solution, and and O'Malley said that it was a short-term uh, solution, but it was not a it was not a ballpark. It, it would not work for the Dodgers. So ultimately, when he came, that meant the end of the Hollywood Stars. They uh, they came close to staying put and moving down the road to Long Beach. A city councilman. Uh, made a presentation uh, at the end of the 1957 season to the Coast League uh, owners meeting, caught everybody off guard because nobody really knew a lot about Long Beach. And when they started looking at the numbers, they were very impressed. The Dodgers had bought the LA Angels and planned to move them north to uh, Spokane. And Buzzy Bavese tried to change midstream. When he saw that, he thought, if we put our team in, in Long Beach, we can save a lot of money. And the Long Beach... Uh, council agreed that they would only play on Dodger off nights. They would only have home games when the Dodgers were out of town. Uh, but ultimately things were changing in the Coast League. We had seen the Oaks move to Vancouver and uh, there was a Northwestern shift in, in power in the Pacific Coast League. A group from Salt Lake City uh, wanted to try and buy the, the Hollywood stars and Cobb was actually out of the room to take a business call. And when he was out, they hastily put together a vote and voted to allow the uh, Salt Lake City group to buy the club. And uh, Cobb really uh, lost his negotiating power on that. Uh, the club was sold. Uh, Cobb said he didn't want to be the bad guy. So he just accepted the offer, which was a lot lower than, than what he had hoped to get for the club. And the Hollywood Stars moved on to uh, Salt Lake City and the 20 year run of the Hollywood stars came to an end, but it was a, a remarkable run. It was a mark, not just a remarkable 20 years uh, for the Hollywood stars, but the entire Pacific coast league. Uh, one of the things that, that has really struck me through this process was that for people up and down the West coast, that was the big leagues. That was their big league baseball. And it really crushed a lot of fans, particularly younger fans uh, when the Dodgers and the giants came West and their seals and their Oaks and their angels and their Hollywood stars left in the, Coast League changed forever. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to share that with you. And thanks for the kind words and certainly open to questions. And Marlene, I'll jump on yours first because uh, there were certainly players in the Pacific Coast League. I think Steve Bilko's name comes to mind uh, that didn't want to go to the big leagues because they were very, very well taken care of. Uh, Babe Herman, for example, uh, he was Mr. Holdout. He was the king of the holdouts. And there was a particular year where he held out and, and, to be able to uh, to 
help him out in a way he wanted. They gave him an ownership stake in the ball club. It was against baseball rules. They put it in the name of a family member. But uh, these play- George Genevieve shared with me that after playing in 49 and going to Washington in 1950, the major league minimum was $5,000 a season. And that's what the senators gave him. And, and George balked at it and said, I made 6000 in my first season in the Pacific Coast League. And the Senators wouldn't budge. So players like playing in the Coast League because the compensation was a little bit higher than even in the big leagues. Open to thoughts or questions? All right. If you have any questions for Dan, please, uh, you can either speak up. um, Make sure to... uh, be cautious and courteous of others if you try and speak over them. Um, or you could also type your questions in the chat. Perry, I saw your question. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I can't recall the name of the Salt Lake Club, but they weren't there for very long before they moved. Uh, or maybe I might be confusing that with Phoenix. The Giants moved to Fe- – yeah, that's right, the Bees. The Giants – bought the seals as well in a swap with the red Sox. they swapped minneapolis for san francisco and took them to phoenix and i'm i believe that club the hollywood stars is now the tacoma rainiers in the pacific coast well that's not the pacific coast league either well another habit i've got to break this baseball season how do we get the book it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Roman and Littlefield is the publisher and it's on their, uh, their website as well. Thank you. Did the, uh, Tom, you've got an interesting question here and there've been a couple of other chat questions I'll jump back to, but I'll jump on Tom's first. Did the angels and the stars have a rivalry? <laughs> uh, I've talked to players who played in the big leagues with either the giants or the Dodgers and also played in the coast league for either the stars or the angels. And they've all said the same thing to a man. The giant, the great giant Dodger rivalry, one of the greatest in all of sports, was nothing compared to the rivalry between the Hollywood Stars and the LA Angels. Uh, it was it was very intense. Uh, it started when Cobb bought the club, and the the Stars had been in their offices had been in the Angels Tower at Wrigley Field. And uh, when Oscar Reichow had was hired to run the Stars, well, they kicked the uh, the Hollywood Stars people out of the tower. Uh, it was intense. You had the, the amazing uh, battle in, uh, I believe it was 55, the, the Sunday doubleheader between the two teams at Gilmore Field. Uh, Frankie Kelleher was the hitter, and uh, they threw up and in on him a couple of times and then drilled him in the back. Well, Frankie Kelleher was such a soft-spoken but a big guy that uh, his teammates called him Mouse or Mousy. And he simply dropped his bat. He didn't sprint to the mound like we see today. He dropped his bat, calmly walked to the mound. And when he got to the pitcher, he hauled off and punched him in the chest. And they told me that the pitcher flew six feet back in the air, landed on his keister. And by the time he landed, both dugouts were on the field. When they got that brawl broken up, they resumed play. Kelleher was the only one kicked out. Uh, Teddy Beard went in to pinch run for him. I think he was sacrificed to second base and then he stole third base. And when he stole, he went in spikes high, slashed up the, the angels third baseman. Here we go again, Donnie Brook all over this time. The Donnie Brook lasted for 30 full minutes. The chief of police happened to come home from a day at the beach, turn on television and the screen fills with this melee at Gilmore field. He immediately gets on the phone, calls the riot squad, orders them to go to Gilmore field to break this brawl up. Chuck Stevens shared the story that you know, between games of the doubleheader, he walked back into the clubhouse and saw a guy in a suit, plain clothes suit, standing in front of his locker. And he hollered at the clubby to get him out. The man turned, flashed his badge, and introduced himself as the head of the riot squad, gathered the whole ball club together, and told him that these were the ground rules for game two. Nobody was to leave the clubhouse except the nine who were on the field or a catcher and a pitcher who was ordered to go warm up in the bullpen. Nothing took shape at all in the second game of the doubleheader, but by Monday morning, the upcoming series between the two that was a couple of weeks down the road scheduled for Wrigley, Oh, the phone lines were burning up and tickets were selling out fast for the next game between those two teams. It was a very intense rivalry uh, between those two. I'm going to jump into the chat and look at some of these other questions. 
Eddie yeah. Urat, uh, I want to jump there. Bruce's question about Eddie Urat. Um, yeah, he did go back to San Diego, but Eddie Urat was an amazing story uh, with Hollywood. He was one of the uh, group of young players that they were able to bring in. They had high hopes for him. And then when he was away during World War II, uh, they were desperate to, to bring in a third baseman and they made a deal with Cincinnati and uh, brought in a, a third baseman uh, and offered the Reds first option to buy Eddie Urat. When Eddie Urat came back from the war, he became Hollywood's first 20 game winner. And several times during the season, the Reds tried to exercise their opportunity to, to buy him. And Hollywood pointed out that the, the contract stipulated that they couldn't have him until after that season. Uh, but Eddie Urat really didn't let people know that once he got to Cincinnati pretty early in his time with Cincinnati, he hurt his elbow. And, and he was called the next Bob Feller when he was at Hollywood. But uh, he got hurt at Cincinnati and really wasn't the same guy. Finished up in San Diego and, and ended up living uh, the rest of his life in San Diego. Uh, no, Danny Kay had no uh, involvement with the Stars. You're right, he was a huge baseball fan, part owner of, of the Mariners, but uh, uh, no, he did not have uh, any ownership stake in the Hollywood Stars. Uh, they did allow overflow crowds to stand. They, they would, uh, particular games, yes, you're, you're right, uh, Benjamin, they would rope off the outfield. There was no warning track back then. They would rope off the outfield if they expected a, an overflow crowd, and, and they would put uh, a couple thousand fans uh, generally just in front of the, the left field wall uh, uh, in a roped off area. My research, wow. Uh, it was a blast, Marlene, it really was. I, I, and it was, it, was a, it was an emotional roller coaster. I have to share. I mean, certainly I read a lot, um, a lot of articles, people sending me stuff, friends that found out what I was working on would send me things and uh, spent a lot of time going through uh, digitized editions of, of uh, Southern California newspapers and a lot of time in libraries in Northern California going through uh, collections, the, the Dick Dobbins collection uh, had some tremendous stuff, uh, some recordings, some interviews, transcripts, it was great. The librarians there in San Francisco were fantastic. Um, the emotional roller coaster was getting to know a lot of the, the former players and also their family, the family members of former players. Uh, the exciting part was these conversations with the, the children and grandchildren of, of former Hollywood players. And, and, and what struck me was what incredible pride they had. I mean, in, in many cases, their parent or their grandparent had gone on to play in the big leagues. But what they were so proud of was that they were part of the Hollywood stars and, and the, they loved to recite the stories they had been told and, and the friendships that, that their, their parent or grandparent carried through their life of uh, Hollywood stars of, of the celebrities, uh, the relationships they had. Uh, that was really something uh, that, that, that I was really taken by. Um, but the, the tough part of it was, you know, I had some wonderful conversations with guys like Chuck Stevens and, and Jimmy Hardy, the former uh, NFL quarterback who was the star's first ball boy, uh, grew up just blocks from Gilmore Field. Um, How about Paul Pettit? Uh, uh, pardon? How about Paul Pettit? You know, you just took the words out of my mouth, Jim. Paul became a great friend through my work on the George Genovese book. And Paul and I talked every couple of weeks for several years. And, and, and you know, when I, each of these guys would pass, it was just, it just tore my heart out. It was crushing. And particularly Paul, I had just talked to him uh, a couple of days before he had his stroke. And uh, he was sharing one of the funniest baseball stories I had ever, ever heard. And and to lose him was, uh, it was tough. Um, that was a tough part of the book. But uh, what I also enjoyed was how excited they were that these stories were going to be told. And, and, and they, they too had great pride in their time with the Hollywood stars and, and were excited about that being shared. And the reason for their pride being shared with other people. So yeah, that was, it was a real rewarding experience, Marlene. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I don't know the name of the lumber company Eddie Urat was at, darn it. Good question. I, I didn't follow through with where he worked uh, after his career, Bruce. I did speak to, to exchange some emails with his son and uh, his son had a few uh, stories as well about uh, some of the celebrities that he befriended and uh, what a fun time he had with Hollywood. 
Dan, I don't know if you saw it there in the chat, but <clears throat> there's a question about the racial integration of the stars in the Pacific Coast League. You know, I'll touch on that. In a, in a, in a, in a, thanks, Steve, for bringing that up. Uh, on record, the Hollywood Stars were one of the last teams in the league. I think the, the seventh of eight to integrate. In 1951, they made a trade with San Diego for Roy Wellmaker, who had pitched with the Homestead Grays and also was a big star in Venezuela. But in reality, you know, what I was struck by, I came across an interesting story, and it was, it, it involved quite a lot of research to try and confirm this. But there was a, there were stories in, in, in the LA Eagle, the California Eagle, which was the, the African-American newspaper in, in Los Angeles at the day. And it was about two high school kids um, that Hollywood, that were being signed out of a Hollywood tryout camp. And what was really confusing to me was that the articles talked about them being signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, Brooklyn was just at that time becoming, through Fred Haney's work, the Dodgers major league affiliate. But the tryout camp was something at Sawtell Field that Hollywood had done for years. And the scout who brought them in and signed these two players was Rosie Gilhausen, who was the Hollywood scout and later, I mean, he was, became a legend, scouted uh, uh, when Hollywood was sold and Pittsburgh was the parent club. Pittsburgh took him on as one of their scouts. So I was really confused. And, I, and actually on a visit to the Hall of Fame, uh, I went through the player cards to try and, and see if I could get clarification. In particular, the player that I'm speaking of, his name was Eddie Moore. And Eddie Moore was a really good high school player in Los Angeles. Um, initially went to Tuskegee Institute to play football, but his father died. He came back home to help his mother out and was at Los Angeles City College. And he played on a team that was called the Eagles. The Eagles were an all-black team in L.A. semi-pro leagues, which was just huge at that time. A lot of big league guys played. I talked to guys who played against the Eagles, said they were a really talented team. Their benefactor was the drummer in Count Basie's band. And uh, their coach tipped off Rosie that, that the St. Louis Browns uh, had been asking about Eddie Moore. And, and he was a pretty good size 6'1", 6'2", center fielder. And so Rosie brought him to this tryout in front of Fred Haney at Sawtell Field, and Rosie signed him. And they, they, they brought him in initially to, to Hollywood Spring Training and very quickly, within a day or two, decided that he was overmatched and they needed to farm him out. Hollywood had created a farm club. They had started from scratch the Billings Mustangs. That was Bob Cobb's adopted hometown. And so they, they sent him up to Billings. Well, he was the very first African-American player to play in the, in the Pioneer League. And where I finally got clarification was from Gar Myers. I don't know if Gar ever attended any of the reunions, but Gar was Paul Pettit's high school catcher. And Gar was signed by Rosie Gilhausen for Hollywood. And in Billings, Gar was Eddie Moore's roommate, and they became really good friends. And Gar was very adamant to me that the Dodger information that, that he signed with the Dodgers initially was incorrect, that he was signed by Hollywood. So in four, January of 49, which the, the signing of Eddie Moore would have been the second, Af I believe, I could be wrong now, but it, it seems as though he was the second African-American player signed by a Pacific Coast League team, but he never played for Hollywood. And, and the reason that I found out why Eddie Moore later shows up in the Dodgers organization, it was explained to me, and then I did finally find some articles and some paperwork to confirm this, Hollywood, uh, Bob Cobb became very close with Branch Rickey when they became a Brooklyn farm team. When Branch Rickey left and went to the Pittsburgh Pirates, Hollywood told his successor, Buzzy Bavese, they wanted to break the agreement and move to become a Pittsburgh farm club. Buzzy Bavese demanded a dozen players as compensation for breaking that agreement. Gar Myers was one. Norm Sherry, who had signed with Hollywood out of Fairfax High, was another. That's how he got into the Dodgers organization. And Eddie Moore was the third, of the, uh, the third player out of those 12. And Eddie Moore ultimately got to AAA very quickly. He had some big years. He was at, at, at uh, Billings for two years. His second year was huge. Um, he was a great power hitter and Gar Myers told me that it, at uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul, St. Paul was Brooklyn's farm club. Uh, he was the victim of a terrible beaning and he was never the same. Brooklyn released him. He went to Mexico. He had a couple of big power years in Mexico. They brought him in 1959. Pittsburgh brought him to Salt Lake City 
uh, for that uh, about half the season, and then he was ultimately released and didn't play again. So, yeah, I think in terms of a player playing for Hollywood, yeah, he was uh, Roy Wellmaker was the first to suit up for Hollywood, um, and that was the eight, the seventh of eight. I'm in the middle of another book right now that really gets a lot more deep into uh, that situation in the Pacific Coast League, and it's it's really quite interesting about the war years and efforts that went on to to try and integrate and and the player that Oakland and L.A. and Hollywood were, was really pushed to try and sign was was Kenny Washington, the football legend, who was an even better baseball player. But uh, that's for a talk in a year and a half when that book comes out. Oh, uh, Dan, can I interrupt for a second? Um, we have a, a couple of people I'd like to point out on the, the screen here. We have one PCL alumni who joined us at our last PCL reunion, uh, Don Farber from the Oakland Oaks. And Don, thanks very much for uh, joining us tonight. I wanted to welcome you. If you want to uh, unmute yourself and say a couple of words to everybody, that would be great. Zach, can you unmute him? I don't have the abil ability to, I can ask to unmute, but I, after I do a mute all, I cannot do a uh, individual. Oh, okay. Yeah, Don, you'll have to hit that button at the bottom of your screen that says uh, unmute and mute and just click that and that'll get your uh, voice uh, uh, working on it. There you go. I think you got it. Oh. Nope, you, you, you muted it again. <laughs> uh, playing in Salinas. And uh, there was the $100,000 bonus baby, Paul Pettit. And they were trying, I guess he, just, he, he blew out his arm, and maybe and he was trying to make a first baseman out of him. And his wife was having a baby. Now he's he got a hundred thousand dollar bonus. I'm sure uh, he didn't get it all at once. But the entire the entire stadium and and the players on both teams didn't make a hundred dollars, hundred thousand dollars. But they but they wanted to pass the hat around to buy uh, Paul Pettit's wife a, a gift. Uh, that was one thing I remember. Other than uh, Chuck Estrada, who was a pitcher on that team as well. That's great, Don. Thanks for sharing. Now, I, uh, there's over 50 people at the meeting tonight, so I've been going back and forth to the different screens throughout the meeting, and I noticed the family of a very good friend of mine that's on, and unless they're calling in from Olegio, Italy, uh, it's got to be Rugger's son. Uh, if you want to say a few words, uh, uh, we, I certainly miss uh, uh, Rugger quite a bit. We used to get together all the time, and he was a great guy. Yes, hi. This, this is Bill Ardizoya. Uh, indeed, uh, Rugger was my father, and uh, he passed away in uh, 2016. And uh, uh, he's mentioned a couple times in uh, Dan's book, which I uh, thought was really great. Uh, the um, what I point out to the members of the, uh, on the call is that they did a um, a great interview from the New York Times uh, in 2016, and if you Google it. Uh, you'll come across it, uh, Rugger Artizoya, New York Times. And at the time, he was the oldest living Yankee. Um, he uh, had a cup of coffee uh, there in uh, uh, 1947, um, where uh, he faced the uh, St. Louis, the dreaded St. Louis Browns, and um, he uh, actually grooved a pitch, I think, to Walt Judnick, his old uh, buddy from um, the uh, Mission District in San Francisco. And uh, that was kind of the end of uh, his Yankee career. Uh, but he was named to the uh, uh, All-Yankee, All-Italian team, uh, not because of those two innings, but, but the fact that he was uh, the only Yankee at the time uh, actually born in Italy. Uh, so uh, uh, that was a real high point, but uh, uh, he, he lived baseball and uh, to the day he died. And um, so I appreciate the uh, recognition. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. 
Yeah, R Rugger was the greatest right-hander to come out of Commerce High. And uh, at one time I owned a restaurant and, and Rugger was the, uh, the linen salesman. That's right. Oh, he's, he's quite a guy. Yeah, he, he, uh, he, he could tell a story or two, couldn't he? <laughs> yeah, he was really good. In fact, uh, you talk about that uh, article in, in the uh, New York Times and uh, 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 the, the guy that did it, whose name is escaping right now, a young guy, but he really did his homework. And uh, uh, Bill, your dad, uh, the last uh, oh, five or 10 years of his life, every time he would have an interview, he would call me up. Uh, he had told me so many of his stories uh, that I remembered uh, when he would forget something, he'd look over at me and I could fill in the, uh, the words that he was missing and get him right back on track. And I remember when the, uh, the New York Times reporter came over and we were both talking about it uh, uh, a few days in advance. This kid's not going to know anything on baseball. And, and the kid shows up and he's in his late 20s. Uh, Louis Lazar is his name. And, and Louis was really, really good. He, he wrote a, a very good article. He was very respectful to Rugger. Uh, and, and told everything uh, uh, the way it was. But uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun and it was great to see him get that recognition there. Uh, we were also involved with uh, another friend through the PCL Historical Society, uh, works with the baseball program at San Quentin Prison. And Rugger was given a day out there and uh, he went out, uh, threw out the first pitch um, and uh, the, the inmates again treated him uh, with uh, unbelievable respect uh, the, the line was 40 or 50 long and they were bringing pieces of toilet paper and uh, pieces <laughs> of cardboard to have them sign and he talked with every single one of them and it was uh, uh, such a kick. Uh, I know he had gone there uh, back in the 50s when he was playing semi pro ball uh, as a lot of guys had done and, and played in the prison uh, back then and, and uh, we were talking about it uh, before and, and after that event and uh, how things had changed in, in the 50 or so years since he had been in there. Uh, in the 50s, when outside teams would go to San Quentin, uh, you weren't allowed to exchange any words with the inmates uh, that were on the baseball team or elsewhere. But yet at the end of the game, you'd go to the shower and you'd be next to the inmates in the same shower, which is pretty dangerous. And then of course, in, in modern times, uh, when you see these guys on the field, they're, they're all handpicked. It's, it's not the, uh, the ax murderers and, and uh, the arsonists and such like that that are dangerous to society. But uh, uh, you, you'd swear that you're in a, uh, a convention of accountants in Minneapolis or something uh, where it's, it's the, uh, the mildest group of guys that are there and they're, they're pretty open about what they did. But uh, again, they were very, very respectful to, uh, uh, to Rugger and his friend Lynn Adams uh, had uh, joined us that day and, and uh, uh, you know, it, it was really a, a great experience. But uh, uh, Bill, I really appreciate you joining uh, tonight because I think the last time I saw you was at the, uh, uh, the cemetery the day of his uh, funeral. Very well. Wasn't Rugger the last of the Mitchell Reds? He was, yes. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, actually, uh, Dan had uh, uh, given me an invitation because um, I had contacted him after uh, reading the book and uh, seeing my dad's name in it. So I did make contact with Dan. And so for Dan, thank you uh, for the invitation. Bill, I just wanted to say it means a lot that you're here tonight and, and your call and our, our frequent emails these last few weeks have meant a lot to me and I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm sorry I wasn't wearing my, my Hollywood stars cap tonight. That's downstairs, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> Hi, this is Leo Smith. Do you have a question? Leo, if you have a question, we can't hear you. I can jump through some of these in chat real quick while we wait for Leo. But uh, first off, Steve Heath, Carlos Bernier, <laughs> he wasn't just one of your least favorite guys. Uh, not many guys on the Hollywood stars liked him either. Uh, and it, it really sad. He, he, you know, obviously he had the incident where he uh, punched the umpire and, and was suspended indefinitely. Uh, uh, it really tore him up as well, but it ruined his reputation. He, he did get up to Pittsburgh very briefly, had hamstring problems that year and never really got another, another shot at the big leagues. Uh, such a volatile player throughout his career. And I think the sad thing is that uh, later, I think that it was really traced back to a beaning that he got uh, 
in his first season in the States playing uh, with the Tampa Smokies. And, and ultimately he, he committed suicide. Uh, just a real tragic story because he was an extremely talented player. Uh, Steve, your thought about the schedules? Absolutely. And, and to kind of tack on to the George Genevieve story when, when George was complaining to Clark Griffith of the Senators about their contract offer, that's what Clark Griffith threw back at him. You know, you, yeah, you made more money in the Coast League, but you played more games too. You played 50, 60 more games than we do in the big leagues. So yeah, the schedule was amazing. Charles, thanks for your, your comments on the Genovese book. That was a, a real labor of love. I, I loved it. And, and, and Tim, I appreciate that as well. And it's I'd love to chat with you sometime a little bit more about Eddie and his son, William. That's great. Uh, Greg, I, you know, that's one of my frustrations in, in my research. Uh, Greg asked if I've ever seen the architectural plans that Stiles Clements produced. Uh, and and I, I searched high and low. I, I contacted his grandsons who are both architects now, one in the San Diego area, uh, one still in Pasadena and uh, no luck there. I went through the California Association where plans get registered and, and I just had no luck everywhere I turned to try and find those plans. Now, a few years later, when Branch Rickey was trying to bring about, I believe it was 1960, the Continental League, uh, Mark Scott, who was the Hollywood Stars radio broadcaster and the host of Home Run Derby, uh, Mark Scott uh, put together investment with uh, Chuck Connors and uh, uh, Joe Friday, the actor, uh, oh, somebody help me, uh, uh, the actor on Dragnet all those years. Uh, anyway, uh, Jack, Webb. Jack, Jack, Webb. Webb. Jack, Jack Webb. Webb, thank you very much, Jack yeah. Webb. And, uh, and they uh, pursued a, a franchise in the uh, uh, in the Continental League for Los Angeles. And at their initial press conference, I, I found pictures of Mark holding up a stadium design. And, and my, uh, my curiosity was whether that design might have been what Styles Clements designed for Hollywood, but uh, I didn't have any luck tracking that down. So uh, they've got to be out there. And, and I really wanted to find that to put in the book and unfortunately uh, didn't have any luck on that, darn it. Has there ever been a thought of having a Dodger Angel retro game in the Stars and Angels old uniforms? Well, I'd love to see that. And I did a talk recently uh, where somebody brought that up as well, Sid. I shouldn't have said that because you deserve all the credit for that great idea. Uh, but it, it, they've had Hollywood Stars games, but they're just games involving celebrities at Dodger Stadium, uh, but it would really be fun, I think. I, I think everybody probably that has seen the different uniform look through the years uh, probably has a favorite, but uh, I love the, Gail Patrick had a hand in designing their their home and away 1939-1940 uh, uniforms, the first of the, the Cobb ownership group, and uh, I love those uniforms, and I think it would be a lot of fun if the Dodgers would, would do a retro game and, and wear those uniforms someday. The A's, the Giants, and the Mariners have done the turn back the clocks and have recognized the PCL a number of times over the years. Right, uh, but the Dodgers uh, never have. And, and I'd love to see, of course, the Angels have strictly uh, stayed to uh, Major League Angels uh, throwback uniforms and not necessarily the Coast League Angels. But, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see them do that. I'd love it. With you. Yes, uh, Tom Nahigian, your, your question about the schedule, and, and Mark, I know you know this and can elaborate on this as well, but uh, for many, many years, um, the way the schedule was structured was a team would be in a city for a week. Monday was always your travel day. The series would run Tuesday through Sunday, and the Sunday game would be a doubleheader. And so if you were going to Seattle, you'd spend the week in Seattle, and they'd basically go two-week road trip. They'd go up and do Seattle and then Portland right after. Uh, so yeah, you would spend an entire week playing uh, seven games in six days uh, in that particular city. Well, Dan, we really do appreciate your time. Um, and I will make sure that this is uh, posted and available um, on YouTube within the next couple of days. Uh, for those that do not have it, make sure to pick this book up. Um, it's in stock on Amazon. Get it within a day or two on Prime. Um, definitely worth the uh, definitely worth the purchase. Uh, you definitely will enjoy it, uh, Dan. I, I, we can't thank you enough. 
Um, this has been a great evening and we're, we've been lucky to have you uh, grace us with your presence and share My those treat. great stories. My treat. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate it very much. Thanks everybody for being here. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great night and uh, we look forward to having you join us on our next one.